All right, thank you everyone for joining us for today's University of Texas Energy Symposium. I'm Kerry King, Assistant Director and Research Scientist at the Energy Institute here at the University of Texas at Austin. And before I introduce today's speaker, I will let you know what's coming up. Uh, what's coming up next week might be something that might be a slight counter or at least an additional discussion of today's discussion by Julia Steinberger. She is a professor and University of Lausanne, and she studies how we can have nice lifestyles by consuming less, and specifically consuming less energy. So she will give us a discussion about that, her studies about how we can have good livelihoods with less energy consumption. Uh, the following week after that, September 26th, will be a local uh, business person, Mike Leggett. He's the CEO and founder of Resilient Grid. They kind of study how people interact with machines and make decisions. And so he's going to discuss uh, when situ situational awareness, mental models, and adaptive capacity meet control room surprises. So if you think, what were the people in the control room at ERCOT doing when Winter Storm Yuri hit in 2021? That's the kind of thing he helps work on, is to help people manage those situations from a human factor standpoint. So that's what we have coming up. But today, we have Arthur, or Art Berman. So it's my pleasure to have him. So a little background. On art, he's a petroleum geologist, been working for 45 years in the energy industry of both fossil and non-fossil energy sources. And he routinely gives keynote addresses for energy conferences, boards of directors and professional societies. He's published more than hundred articles on energy and their effect on earth systems, including the climate. And he has 38,000 followers on Twitter. So follow him at, at AE Vermin 12 or X, what we're calling it this day. So he certainly beats me on the followers. Uh, today's talk, I think he's attempting to be a little provocative, so he's hoping for a bit of engagement with the audience here. So uh, his statement, there is no energy transition, no paradigm shift or green revolution. The popular idea that fossil fuels can be and are being replaced by renewable energy is false. New energy sources have always been additive with no empirical evidence for the replacement of one energy source by another. Renewable energy requires materials that use fossil energy resources for their extraction, transport, manufacture, distribution, construction, et cetera. Four essential pillars of modern civilization are steel, concrete, plastic, and ammonia. None of these are possible without fossil energy. Energy substitution is a doomsday stratagem. I'm sure he'll probably explain this title to us. But that condemns civilization to its status quo, path of growth, and biophysical destruction. There's no amount of non Fossil energy will, no amount of non-fossil energy will make a difference unless we lower total energy consumption and accept its consequences of no growth. Climate change is a big problem, but it's a subset of a larger problem of biophysical overshoot. We have exceeded the carrying capacity of the planet. Continued economic and material growth based on renewable energy does not begin to resolve that fundamental reality. So it's time to get honest. Growth is the core of the human predicament. If anybody's interested in other overshoot discussions, you can look up the discussion with Bill Reese that was one or two semesters ago on this UT Energy Symposium, uh, and also discussions by Nate Hagens. That's also been part of this series. So with that lengthy introduction, I'll now bring up here Arthur or Art Berman. Thank you very much. Thank you for that introduction, Kerry. Um, so, yeah, as far as uh, your next speaker, I'm, I'm sure that she and I agree that we can all have nice lives, uh, consuming less. Uh, I'm not, uh, I, don't, I don't, I mean, I know, I know of her work. I, I'm not sure that, uh, that we'll have the same level of prosperity or standard of living that we do right now, but um, that doesn't mean we, we, we can't have good lives. So uh, I, as Carrie said, uh, I intentionally uh, designed this talk to be a little bit provocative or out of the mainstream that in no way means that I'm negative or um, uh, have a, a, a doomy kind of a view of, of the future. I'm I'm a scientist. Um, I've spent my entire life, uh, professional life, in the energy business, and therefore I'm 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 trying to be objective. Not trying. I'm well. I am being objective, at least as far as 
as the data allows me to. And, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you what I know and I'll tell you what is interpretive or opinion, but most of what I'll show you is, is, is what we know right now. So um, substituting renewable energy for fossil fuels is a doomsday stratagem. That is, that is my unfortunate conclusion. And uh, I base that, uh, you know, as, as Kerry said, I, I spent a lot of my career in, you know, looking for oil and gas and working for oil and gas companies and clients in that, that sector. Um, I do not have any bias toward fossil fuels whatsoever. Um, I don't have a negative bias either. Um, I fully accept, embrace the fact that most of our uh, carbon emissions come from fossil energy of one sort or another. There's, there's no, there's just no getting around that. Uh, having said that, uh, without fossil energy, uh, we're kind of screwed. And uh, as, you know, Carrie mentioned, a couple of my, my friends and colleagues, Bill Reese and, and Nate Hagens, and since he already introduced them, uh, one of Nate's uh, favorite uh, comments is, that uh, renewable energy is uh, a perfectly fine way to power a civilization, just not this one. And as, uh, as Bill, who's a, a little drier um, than, than Nate, uh, as, as Bill likes to say, the only thing worse than the green revolution not working is, is what if it does? Um, and of course, Bill's coming from, well, and I say, of course, maybe you don't know, but Bill is an ecologist and, and he's thinking about uh, what will happen to the, the earth and natural systems if we manage to figure out how to continue using just as much energy as we are right now. So I'm 100% in favor of renewable energy. Um, I don't have solutions for you. I'm you know trying to be the best scientist I know how, which is to, to describe the current situation, uh, to explain it as best I can, uh, to base it on information that I have and we all have. Everything I'm showing you is public data. You know, it's a pain in the ass to find it all, but anybody in this room can. And if you need help, let me know. Uh, but I'm basing it on history up to this point, what we have today and what's likely to change. Um, because if you don't know where you are and how you got here, it's kind of difficult to do the very difficult job of predicting the future. So with that, um, my view based on all of this analysis that I've done decades worth really, is that climate change is kind of a narrow view of the human predicament. And so we've, we've got this, uh, let's see if I can figure out how to, use the pointer, maybe it doesn't matter. I know that, oh, here we go. Yeah, so, you know, here's this guy, and, and I'd say, or woman, I don't know which it is, unisex, uh, non-binary, probably. Um, this, this, they are um, looking really, really hard at, at carbon emissions, because that is what, we're told or we believe that climate change is all about, but, but there's all these other factors, you know, and, and you can read them yourself, but, um, you know, one that I'll point to right away is, you know, down in, in the bottom here, I guess this really, eh, it doesn't work so well on white, overconsumption, and by overconsumption, I mean overconsumption of energy, uh, air pollutants, well, you know, CO2 is, is an air pollutant. I mean, uh, not to minimize its effect, but when you burn energy, when you use energy, there's a waste product. And one of the main waste products other than heat is carbon dioxide. And, you know, when, when we have politicians talk about uh, clean energy, well, geez, I mean, all energy is clean. <laughs> It's, it's when you use it, when you turn it into work, that, that you have problems. And all converted energy is dirty. Some is more dirty than others, but, you know, there's, there, there's, you know, there, there's, there's no free ride here. I mean, if you're going to, if you're going to do work and you have to do work to live, then there's going to be byproducts. 
uh, you know, there's there's uh, all sorts of things on here. I mean, poverty, biodiversity lost, all that kind of thing. But uh, the main thing is, is that if all you're looking at is carbon emissions, CO2, and that's what, I don't know what percentage, but a very high percentage of people who are concerned about climate change are looking at, then you're actually missing um, a huge part of the picture. And that's a problem. It's not a problem for you. It's a problem for all of us and for the planet. So I think a broader perspective is needed that includes, and these are just you know, some of them, but absolutely it has to include energy, has to include economics, has to include population, ecology, and human behavior. Uh, nothing in this world uh, happens or, or is understandable in you know my 70 some odd years if you're not thinking about human behavior. So as, as Kelly read, um, in my view, and, and I base this on data, um, there is no energy transition. So you know if, if you look at the graph over here, and I know there's you know, there's a lot of junk on it, but the uh, the yellow is um, is population, and um, and the uh, uh, I'm sorry, total energy, and all the various components are then then shown. And, and what you can see here is is that it goes back to 1800, and we can talk about how accurate the data is in 1800 versus today. But I think notionally it's it's reasonable, and so. Uh, you want to talk about an energy transition. Well, what was the main form of, of energy that was being used in 1900? Well, in 1800, it was biomass. Okay, well, look at biomass. I mean, we're actually using more biomass today, wood and other things that we burn, than we used in 1800. So the idea of a transition sort of implies that you're getting rid of something old and replacing it with something new well you know that that didn't happen with biomass we're actually using more of it today than we were uh well you know even in the middle of the last century look at coal coal came you know onto the scene here kind of in the middle of the 1800s started building and and you know you can argue about what's happening up where we are right now, kind of going up and down. But I mean, no doubt, we are using a whole bunch more coal today than we used in 1800 or 1900 or 1950. So, so what I'm trying to say here, not trying to say what I am saying is that, you know, despite this, this rise, the sharp rise in renewables, which is this, this black thing right here, uh, you know, it's no sharper than, than oil. It's a little sharper than natural gas. It's certainly sharper than coal. Nothing is going away. So we need to understand what do we mean by an energy transition? What we mean, what I mean, or what I interpret from this graph is that renewable energy is essentially a fossil fuel extender. Okay, we're figuring out new ways of getting more energy, but we're not getting rid of anything. If that's a transition in your mind, you know, we can have a talk about it later, but it's certainly not the kind of transition that most people are thinking about. Um, so what people are talking about or what people think they mean has never happened in the history of man. We've never replaced a previous form of energy with a new one. Now, you want to talk about percentages? Oh, absolutely. The percentage of biomass is a whole lot less than it was, say, in 1850 or 1900. But the point is, is that we're not, we're not making any progress at all toward using less total energy. And so percentages can change. But as long as you're increasing total energy, you're kind of missing the picture if you're focused on just percentages. So this cool guy here, this is a, a Nate Hagen's creation. Um, this is a, uh, a fossil energy slave, um, as, as Nate likes to call them. And, and so this is how we understand, I think we need to understand 
the modern world. And that is to say that, yeah, we've had a tremendous amount of material progress since 1800. I mean, the standard of living of the world in general, yeah, there's still people that are starving and having a hard time. But overall, I mean, the we, we've managed to lift the standard of living, the average standard of living immeasurably from where we were 200 years ago. And there's a, there's a meme um, in certainly the United States and a lot of civilization that we've done that through ingenuity and technology. And to that, I say nonsense. We've done it because of fossil fuels. Um, not to say that technology, not to say that uh, ingenuity are not factors, but um, they are stowaways on the super tanker of fossil fuels. They think that they're directing the voyage and they're completely unaware of these massive diesel engines underneath their feet that are actually directing the voyage. So I'm not in any way negative or opposed to technology. I love it, uh, love ingenuity, value it, but they are, those are very much secondary factors. It's this guy, it's, it's the, the, the fossil fuel slave that is responsible for the prosperity such as it is that we have accomplished. So if you do the arithmetic and, and you can look this up, you know, how many, joules or kilowatt hours or you know whatever you however you want to measure you know, calories how much energy is in a barrel of oil and the answer is um a lot and if you look at how much energy or how much work really um a human being does and divide the amount in a barrel of oil by how much work we do in a day, it works out to the fact that a barrel of oil contains about four and a half years of human labor. Okay, so when, when you hear people complain about $80 oil, $90 oil, $100 oil, wow, I mean, if it costs $1,000, and again, I'm not defending oil, but if it costs $1,000, I mean, who in this room even as students would be willing to work for four and a half years for a thousand dollars. I mean, you'd all turn down that job in a flash, I hope, okay? Because it's just not enough money. So, so this is why fossil fuels is such a powerful thing, or oil is a powerful thing, because there's just nothing like it. It's 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 magic. So much work in a barrel of oil. So the, this table, which you know you probably can't really read and you don't need to, I've simply taken the latest information on oil, gas, and coal, and how many BTUs per whatever or you know whatever energy measure you want, and worked it out into some kind of barrels of oil equivalent. And so the world consumes something like 380 billion barrels of oil equivalent per year. And if you multiply that by 4.5, that means that 24 seven, we have 350 billion of these guys working for us, slaves. One of the reasons that human slavery went out of business is it couldn't compete with this guy. So that means that if you take that number and divide by every human being on earth, even extremely poor people, we've all got 44 slaves on average working for us. And you know, you go back to the early days of, of this country and I mean, a, a landowner who had 44 slaves, he was a rich dude, man. I mean, that was, that was a costly enterprise. Well, now everybody's got 44. And if you're, you know, Elon Musk or one of those guys, you've got tens of thousands of them. But this is the reason that fossil energy is such a killer. And this is the reason why we live the kind of lives that we do, like it or not. Back to the theme, climate change is not the biggest problem that we face in the world. It's a big problem, okay? It scares me to death. 
but it is not the biggest problem we have, certainly not in the near term. And uh, for those of you who saw my friend Bill Reese, uh, whenever that was a few semesters ago, this is, this is his, his graph. And what he will tell you and I will agree with is that climate change is nothing more than a symptom of exceeding the planetary boundaries of the earth that we live on. We're using so much of the earth that it can, and polluting it so much by you know whatever co2 uh chemicals i mean you name it that it can't recover the earth is pretty resilient and can recover from all the damage that humans have done to it over our 300 000 year existence at least as homo sapiens but today we're polluting and using it way faster in fact if you do the calculation um, we're using about 1.7 Earths today. Um, you know, if that were your savings account, you'd be broke pretty soon. That's the problem. So what's the main cause of overshoot? And I'm here talking about ecological or biophysical overshoot. Um, the main reason is human population. That human population at the end of World War I was about 2 billion. And what's it today? It's eight. And how did we get here? We got here simply, the simplest answer is by means of ammonia, fossil fuel made from natural gas. Until the end of World War II, there was a, there was a negative feedback in the system, which said the earth can't feed more than about 2 billion people. And somebody, a couple of somebodies in Germany figured out how to liquefy air and create a free source of nitrogen. We've always known how to make fertilizer. We used, you know, back guano and all, but we didn't have a good source of nitrogen. Liquefy air, we got tons of nitrogen. Fertilizer is what made the human population 8 billion. By creating that huge population, we started putting more waste and heat into the system. Climate change was one effect of that. There are many more. That's also why the economy has grown to, you know, hundreds of times more than it was just 50 or 100 years ago. More people buy more stuff, use more energy, et cetera. Well, one of the things, and I, I hope this startles you because it startles me, is this is a graph that shows the Average abundant of abundance of wild animal species, everything, fish, insects, reptiles, all that kind of stuff. Everything that isn't a human or somehow a livestock or a pet of humans. And since 1970, 53 years ago, the average abundance of species on earth has declined by 69%. I mean, if this were a country, we'd all be screaming genocide. I mean, worse than any genocide that we know of in, in, in human history. There may have been some that we don't know about, but I mean, 70% of the wild animal species, of the, wild an the number of wild animals are gone. 95% of marine fisheries are exhausted, 95%. And this has all happened in the last 50 years. So for people, who say that, oh, you know, all this kind of stuff is alarmist, you know, climate change and, you know, some sort of biodiversity. Ah, you know, it's just natural. This just happens naturally. Well, this is not natural. This is because of us, human beings, pushing out, pushing ourselves into animal habitats, polluting the rivers, polluting the air, polluting the land, polluting the oceans, and either or making it impossible or nearly impossible for wild animals to live. Now, I'm not here, I'm not, you know, it's not some sort of a lonely hearts club. I'm not, you know, saying, you know, I'm not a tree hugger. I mean, it's just a fact, okay? This is a fact and you can, you know, you can find this data set online. It's freely available. So energy substitution. So I told you that we, you know, we've got something like, 380, I think, or 50, I can't remember the number, you know, billion 
fossil slaves working 24 seven. Well, this chart shows not how much, but how much has been added every year. And it starts in 1975. And so we've got oil in blue, natural gas in red, coal in dark gray, and then out here since really the beginning of 2000, the yellow or whatever color that is, is wind and solar. So we are adding 5 billion, 4.7 new fossil or new energy slaves every year on top of this huge number we already have. This, my friends, is the reason for the human predicament. And anyone who says that we're making progress on climate change, I think needs to show me some evidence to that effect. Now, I wish, I, I hope I'm wrong, but I haven't found it. So what does this mean? This means that if we continue consuming more and more energy, we are likely to collapse the biosphere of planet Earth. We'll, we'll, continue, we'll, we'll finish the job that the last 50 years has started. There won't be very much of a natural system. And I hate to say it, but without a biosphere in good shape, I think I didn't read that on a previous slide, Vaslav Shmiel, there is no life. I mean, at some point, this catches up to human flourishing. We cannot flourish. If our food chain is gone, we're dead. Okay, now I don't think that's gonna happen because there are feedback loops that are built in and one of them is economic collapse and that'll fix the climate and a lot of other things. Um, and it won't, I don't think, cause human beings to become extinct and it won't mean that we're all gonna be living in abject poverty, but we're not gonna be living like we are now, as I said, when we started it. So what we need to do is to understand that non-fossil energy, the wild animals, the ecosystem, which is the true wealth of human beings and all species on the planet, it doesn't give a crap about what form of energy we're using. As long as we're expanding into that space, we are headed towards some doomsday scenario at some point in the not too distant future. So I don't care if we're cutting down on emissions, I don't care if we're you know, stopping fossil fuels altogether. I mean, we can talk about the implications, but as long as we keep growing economically and physically and materially, we are destroying the place we live, which is not a very smart thing to do. If you remember nothing more from what I'm talking about than this graph right here, please do. And what it shows very simply is population in gray. It shows energy consumption in blue. It shows carbon emissions in red and the ecological footprint of the human enterprise in green. And what all of you immediately see is you cannot separate any of those five trends. They all lay right on top of each other. And so when you hear people tell you a fairy tale or lie to you and say, oh, we can have economic growth when we're consuming less energy and creating less emissions, show me where. Maybe they don't know that they're telling you something that's untrue or misleading, but show me where that happens. And again, where I started, I mean, I don't know the future, but I mean, this is 1800 to the present. And as a data guy, if there's a trend that's been very strongly established for more than 200 years, you're gonna have to show me that there's a miracle out there that's about to happen that's gonna change that trend. I'm not against it, you just gotta show me. I don't see that happening. So the idea that there is a solution, yeah, there is a solution. What is the primary factor 
among these five, and there are more, okay? I'm not, I'm not trying to oversimplify things. These are the big ones. Anything else, by the way, is a secondary or a tertiary problem. You can just forget about it. You know, is nuclear the answer? Is fusion? It doesn't matter. As long, it's energy, okay? So this, this makes life simple. If you consume less energy, as Julia is going to tell you we can do next week or the next seminar, then GDP economic growth goes down. If economic growth goes down, that's a good thing for carbon emissions and ecological footprint. It's not a good thing for population. Population goes down. We can't support all those people. And, and I challenge any of you to find an environmental or an ecological organization, say the you know, Greenpeace or um, you know, the Nature Conservancy, and I belong to most of these organizations, whose platform is we need to get rid of about four or five billion human beings. Well, they won't say that because that, that, that doesn't sell very well, but that's kind of where, where this goes. So, you know, you, you, can't, you can't just pull pieces out of this thing. So, oh, we're going to solve this. We're going we're gonna to reduce carbon emissions. Okay, that's a great idea. How are we going to do it? Oh, well, we're going to replace fossil energy with renewable energy. Okay, that's great, but we're going to keep energy growth going. Oh, well, that's not so good. If energy growth keeps going, then our ecological footprint keeps increasing, population keeps increasing, GDP keeps increasing, and guess what? We've just shot ourselves in the foot for carbon emissions. We'll reduce them a little bit, but not enough to make a difference. Certainly not in the window of urgency that we have over the next couple of decades. At least that's, that's my, my understanding or view. This says that we're not going to get a bunch of engineers or geologists in here to say, okay, here's what you need to do. You need to get a screwdriver and you need to turn it and get a wrench and a hammer. And, you know, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna work on this thing and we're going to get it right. No, we're going to get it right by addressing the underlying cause of all of this, which is energy consumption. That's what has to happen. We have to use a whole lot less energy. I promise you that won't happen. Nobody is going to voluntarily use less energy. So something horrible, or reasonably horrible, has to happen where we don't have any choice but to use less energy. So if that sounds dark, I'm sorry. But one way or another, I mean, the, you know, the Earth is, is, is a pretty cool system. It, it kind of figures stuff out, or, it, you know, or maybe we figure it out, probably closer to the truth. But you cannot manipulate this. You cannot engineer this into avoiding the fact that you got to consume less energy. So um, I spent last night with uh, some of my family here in Austin. I've got two grandchildren up you know, in Circle C. I've got a bunch of grandchildren elsewhere. And my grandchildren like to get me involved in playing games. And Jenga is one of the games that they enjoy. And everybody loses in Jenga, don't they? <laughs> I usually lose first because they're better at it and they're more agile and they've got smaller fingers. But this is what we're trying to do with energy and renewables. We're trying to pull out a piece that's called fossil fuels and somehow insert a couple of more pieces that are called renewable energy hold our breath and imagine that the tower isn't going to fall down. Well, one of the things you know when you play Jenga is the tower always falls down. You cannot mess with the tower. <laughs> it always falls down. We are not going to keep the tower standing by pulling out pieces and putting in new pieces. It's just not going to happen. Climate change and biophysical overshoot are as obvious as gravity. I mean, the only people who persist in saying that neither of them is happening are people that, well, I don't, I won't say I don't want to talk to. It's just not, it, it, you can't talk to them because they, they have a belief and I respect their belief, 
And they just, they're psychologically incapable of looking at this kind of data, okay? It's just, it's just not gonna happen. Most people, including a lot of people that are very serious about climate change, and certainly the people who lead the world are energy blind. They don't know any of this and that's okay. It's not their field. They, they're not supposed to know it. And those of you in this audience, I mean, some of you are energy blind and some of you are less energy blind. And that's okay too. Um, not everybody's expected to know everything. But for those of us who are not energy blind, I'm here telling you that what we're trying to do right now has been designed by energy blind people and they've created a map that is completely wrong. And if we follow it, we're gonna get lost. That's, that's what happens when you've got a bad map. You know, thankfully Carrie rescued me. You know, I wasn't prepared for all the construction and the chain link fences on the UT campus. And uh, I was lost. I, I, I had a map, but I couldn't go where the map told me to go because of all the damn construction. And lucky for me, you know, he found me and said, okay, we gotta go this way. We need someone to tell us, okay, we gotta go this way because the way that we're going is gonna lead us into a chain link fence. That's a problem. The idea that there are obvious fixes, I wish it were true. I, I just don't see it. This idea or this belief that somehow somebody's gonna figure out something and that's gonna save us, wow. You know, uh, what's the probability of that? Um, I hope it's true, but I'm not gonna bet anything on it. Um, fossil energy, is the reason for, for our material success, um, not technology and innovation. They're helpful, they're important, but they're secondary. And the only thing that I want you to remember, if you can't remember or don't want to any of the rest of this, is that we can't substitute one form of energy for another and hope to solve this problem. It's complex, like most natural systems. Let's acknowledge it. It's complex. You know, I've been studying this my whole life, and I'll tell you there's a ton I don't understand or know about it. The answer, the answer that I've found is we're going to have to use a lot less energy. I already told you that's not happening, not voluntarily. So somewhere out there, um, there's, there's going to be a trauma. That, that's how humans change. And I think we you know, once we see that trauma, we'll have no choice but to change. But a lot of people are not going to live. I think it's time to get honest about the human predicament. And not everybody wants to do that. But that's my message to you. Um, I appreciate your attention. And I'm happy to discuss any of this, all of this with you. Thank you. All right, uh, raise your hands, I'll come. I'll start with one question that's online and I'll come back to Kara at first. All right, uh, we gotta record it for the, we gotta speak in the mic to, for the recording. I can come to you or you can come to me. But so uh, the question online uh, on your systems view is needed, you suggest, or the graph suggests, everyone has the same footprint, like every nation. Uh, is there enough variation in the five critical factors you've shown amongst nations to warrant further investigation, the idea that we all have to have the same footprint, or how do we think about that? On a No, that's, that's a fine question. I didn't say that. Um, I didn't say we all had the same footprint, but that's fine. Um, sure, there are huge differences between nations, absolutely. Um, but the earth doesn't really, you know, the earth doesn't see it that way. Um, animals don't really care why their habitat is going away, whether it's the fault of India or Canada, they just know that their habitat's going away. The natural systems on earth don't really care politically what country is leading the charge to exhaust the earth's resources or pollute it the most. Uh, averages don't really make any difference to the earth and its systems. 
uh, nor do percentages, uh, nor does per capita. I mean, we, we can play all sorts of statistical uh, games with this and convince ourselves that, hey, you know, the richest 1% of people are responsible for, I don't know what percent of emissions and energy consumption. And it's absolutely true, but, you know, big deal. I mean, it's unfair and I wish it weren't the case, but again, you know, the, the, the world, it, it doesn't really care. I mean, you know, until, until something changes. So this blame game, it's just the most childish thing in the world. Whose fault is it? Oh, it's, you know, it's the oil companies. They knew about climate change 50 years ago. Well, yeah, and, and we should be pissed off at them for, you know, for keeping it a secret. But seriously, I mean, if we don't have all the energy that we need when we need it and cheaply, we're really upset. You can't, it just doesn't, I mean, the, 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 the fossil energy companies wouldn't be in business if they didn't have a market. And we're the market. Every one of us is. We need to stop trying to say, who's, who's the worst offender? You know, are, are there good guys? Are there bad guys? No. There's just guys or women. That's all. Guys and gals. All right, next week might have some detail on that particular question, but we will go to a question in the audience. Thanks so much, Art. This is awesome, and I'll definitely be posting it. I hope all of you will, too, and, and share it with your students, those who are teaching. Um, I, I do think, you know, one-child policy globally is something we should all be espousing. I do think, you know, maybe allowing people to take their lives after age 60 if they want to without ruling it a suicide, things like that should be absolutely on the policy list for short-term adoption by as many people who are willing to do it. Um, the question about carbon footprint was really important because the people who are gonna die are gonna be the low footprint people first. So it's not really gonna help us that much. So it'd be nicer if we population collapse more evenly or let the rich people take the hit first, um, which would include those of us in this audience, I'm sure. Right. Um, but I was curious why your friend Bill, who's an ecologist, would worry about the population collapse, since I think it would probably be quite good for animal and plant life. Um, and, and could you tell us a little bit more about Bill's strategy there? Yeah, sure. Um, and, and let me just say before I get to that, that, um, yeah, all these things, um, you know, one, you know, having fewer children and, uh, you know, leaving the world when you feel like it, those are all, and, and, and doing whatever we can personally, uh, you know, keeping the thermostat at 80 instead of 70, those are, you know, giving up red meat. I mean, I don't know. There's a million things we can do. Um, none of that moves the needle. Uh, hate to say it, but it doesn't. But, but do it. Do it for you. If it makes your soul feel good, do it. Allow other people to make those choices. But unfortunately, I mean, you know, Carrie's written a book on uh, called The Superorganism. And um, we're dealing with a superorganism here. I mean, the, the human enterprise is, is, is a lot like that fossil slave. I mean, it, it, it's just, it's just hungry, man. It's growing and it, you know, you're, it's, it's like having a, you know, a discussion with a forest fire. Uh, you can do it, but you're going to lose. <laughs> you're going to get burned. So Bill's uh, comment, he, he's not partisan towards human beings one bit. His concern is, is the state of life. That's what is at risk if our renewable energy experiment is successful, because we just keep on going. If we, if we are successful at substituting fossil fuels with renewable energy, then the graph that I told you to never forget or try not to forget just keeps on going. It's the status quo that's been going on since the Neolithic. You know, humans came onto the scene. We killed every megafauna we could find. Uh, we ran out of those and we started killing each other and we discovered fossil energy and we started killing the planet. I mean, that's just, it's the superorganism. That's what it does. 
And again, it, you know, it's, you're not going to change it. And it's no one's fault. We're all part of it. I hope that answered your question. You are. Uh, another question from the audience. So there's a lot of talk from IPCC and using like climatological data to, you know, consider do temperature, like degrees temperature rises and how that will affect population moving forward. Is there any sort of estimate in like years um, for that kind of collapse that you're talking about, taking into the account this holistic view of mm. climate change with, you know, ecotoxicity and poverty, you know, all the different facets of it? Yeah, well, that's a, that, that's, that's a really important question and uh, thank you for asking it. So everything I said today is not the biggest threat that we have in the near term. And by the near term, I mean this decade or the decade after that doesn't diminish the importance of all this, but this is kind of a, you know, relatively slower uh, train wreck that's going on. The things that, the, the, the number one risk that I see to the system that will potentially collapse, it is financial. I didn't talk about money very much here. I could have, but I didn't. Um, I mean, we came very close to collapsing the financial system a couple of times just in the last 20 years, certainly in 2006, 7, 8. We have the same kind of overshoot going on with our financial system as we do with our, our energy and our ecosystem. And I don't want to get into the details. I'll be glad to talk to you about them offline here, but... Um, Basically, the level of debt that we all have and that society has is ridiculous. And that credit, that debt, is only available because the people that lend us the money or loan it into existence is really what happens. I mean, that, that's another conversation. Yeah, they don't take money from anywhere and they don't print it. They loan it into existence. But that's based on the assumption that we will be productive enough to pay it back. And that productivity is based on a whole lot of data that's founded on fossil energy. And as soon as the financial system, whoever that is, starts to realize or realizes more fully you know, with renewable energy and all that kind of stuff, we're not going to have the kind of productivity to pay the money back, then the credit stops. And the credit stops and the debt takes over and someone's going to lose big time. And my guess conservatively is, I mean, you know, Biden got into a lot of trouble for wanting to forgive student loan debt. I think we're going to be looking at like a 30% or a 40% or a 50% situation where we just got to write it off as a world. So the biggest threat to civilization, human civilization, is financial. The second biggest is geopolitical, war. Okay, we got a good one going on right now. The world's divided up into two camps and... Uh, I don't need to go into the details there, but I mean, if, if even if nothing happens with nuclear weapons, and even if they're, uh, which I suppose is better, I'm not really sure, but seemingly it's not as bad. Uh, I mean, you just look at the amount of energy and pollution and money that goes on with a relatively limited war, like what's going on in Ukraine. Uh, if it gets to the nuclear stage, I mean, you know, and that's that's lights out, even if it doesn't extinguish uh, human species, even if we don't, you know, get rid of New York or Paris or whatever. I mean, the particulates, that's a whole other story. Complexity. I mean, our, every time we solve a problem, things get more complicated and we don't notice it along the way. But the cumulative 
the, the accumulation of complexity, it takes more and more energy to maintain all those complex interactions. Civilizations collapse because nobody's willing to finance <laughs> the complexity anymore. I visited Angkor Wat uh, about six months ago, and Angkor Wat was the biggest city in the world in 1100 AD. More than a million people. That wasn't the city in Europe that reached a million people until the 1400s. And the, the, the story that I was told by the tour guide was, well, there was a big war with the ties and they won and, you know, that was the end of it. Well, actually, that's not true. Angkor Wat, so the, the population collapsed very slowly and not a whole lot of people died. They dispersed. And we don't really know why. But there's there's actually you know core pollen records that show this. Probably what happened? You got a city of a million people. You got to bring in water. You got to bring in food. Aqueducts were necessary. Well, at some point, you know, you just you can't afford to maintain the aqueducts. You can't afford to maintain the supply chains. People start leaving. They say, "Hey, adios." You know, my my cousin down the Mekong River says life's kind of better down there. I'm going. And over the course of decades or centuries, Angkor Wat collapsed. I hope we have a collapse that slow. And then there's the biophysical collapse, the climate change. Okay, next question. Thank you for being here. I really appreciated this. Um, I guess there are a lot of really hard pills to swallow, and it's particularly hard because uh, no, like you said, no one person's at fault and no one started this. Like, you know, we were all just born into this. This is the system in which we exist. And these are, this is how things grow. Um, and I particularly struggle with a lot of these concepts. Um, like for one example would be the one child policy. Like, you know, I'd like to have a family one day and I think I'd like to have more than one kid, even though I totally recognize that would probably be a really useful solution for some of these problems. Mm -hmm. But selfishly, I don't want that, even though I would like a lot of these problems solved. And so a concept I'm really interested in is really just like, you know, how are we going to plant seeds whose shade we're not going to see? Um, and I think that the way that you present this is a really, it really speaks to me, but I'm not sure how effectively it speaks to a broader audience that still wants to see uh their quality of life remain the same, if not get better. And so it seems you've done a lot more communicating about this topic than I have. Um, do you see this as an effective communication method to get these points across or to make a conversation about the solution? Only for people that, are, uh, that want to know more. I can't persuade anyone who doesn't want to learn something that I'm right or they're wrong or that somebody else is right. I can't do it. It's just, it, it doesn't work. And, and so um, I was telling Carrie, I gave a talk that was not hugely different from this uh, just uh, last Thursday at a climate conference in San Marcos, about 300 people there. And I gave the same message and at least a third or a quarter of the people in the audience were enraged. I mean, absolutely, I mean, really mad because what I was telling them challenged their cherished belief that all we got to do is get rid of fossil fuels and use renewables and everything's going to be great. You know, I, I, I didn't, I, I certainly didn't anticipate that. Um, at least not the level. I mean, I think there were there were a lot more people like some of you who said, wow, I don't like hearing that, but I see what you're talking about. But certainly, I mean, a, you know, a very large percentage was, was, was really mad. So I can't, you know, I, I can't do anything about people who are not open to looking at data and information and saying, well, let me think about that. Uh, so my intent, I'm not trying to change anybody. I'd like to, but I know better than that. Um, I don't think there is a solution. I've said that. 
people always want solutions. Uh, I, I wish I had them. Uh, I mean, I've told you the solution, you use less energy. Simple, right? <laughs> no. There's not, we don't like that answer, okay? That, that's just the way it works. So, um, and, and you're right. I mean, there's, we talk about one child or we talk about, uh, you know, people in much poorer countries than the United States. Uh, I mean, don't they have, don't they deserve to grow and, and to prosper the way that we did? And the answer is, you know, the earth doesn't care because it gets screwed, but yeah, of course they do. The reality, the truth is, is that, and I, and I mean this in strictly a data way, I mean, the, the, the ecological and the energy and the carbon footprint of those countries is, is tiny. It doesn't really matter. I mean, the countries that matter are the United States and China and Germany and Russia. And I, I have a graph that I didn't show of GDP, you know, world economic growth versus energy consumption. I mean, it is statistically crazy. It's got an R squared correlation of 0.96. I mean, it just does, I mean, that is statistically perfect. If anybody wants to argue about that correlation, you go for it, All right? That is the correlation and that ain't gonna change. So answer, um, I, I certainly don't think everybody should just do whatever the hell they want, but they're gonna anyway. Okay, that's the way it works. Any other questions? Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Thanks. I like the conciseness and the factual base of it. I really appreciate that. Sure. When we talk about a multivariable problem, we, we try to look at the first order variables, which is more or less what you presented here. I right. appreciate that. One variable that was not in there though, and you gloss over it in my opinion a little bit, is the technology aspect in yeah. that three quarters of the energy we use, we waste. I'm so well, I three quarters that. of the energy we use, we waste in efficient sure. cities and oh, conversions. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, the energy that we useful energy is only one quarter, 25% of what True. we actually consume. So there is a way in some aspects that te technological advancement that can improve that efficiency can significantly reduce our energy required, our service energy versus the total amount we consume. I'm saying not to say it's enough to solve the problem, it certainly isn't, because it doesn't affect the population growth and the other first order variables. But do you see any possibilities or opportunities from a technological approach and making us more energy lean, as in more energy efficient, as one of the first order variables that you didn't produce, present that we could improve upon? Mm -hmm. uh, excellent question. Um... For those of you that don't know any geologists, um, if you ask a geologist a question, doesn't matter what it is, the answer will be, it depends. And, and, and the answer to your question is, is, is it depends. Um, my, my first reaction, the simple answer, and I, you know, I hate reductionist answers, is no, it won't help. Uh, yeah, it's absolutely true that we, you know, that, that we waste a lot of, of energy. Um, it's absolutely true that, uh, you know, that 50, 60, 70% of the oil that's in the ground, we don't know how to, we haven't, we're, we're unable to get out. And for as long as I've been in this business of oil, which I'm really not in anymore, but, uh, or the business of science, it's tantalizing. Yeah, if we could just figure that out, you know, then it'd be great. But we never figure that out is the problem. I mean, there, there's, a, there's an inherent level of waste. I mean, you're using energy, there's going to be, I mean, an awful lot of waste. But I have looked into, and if, if any of you, uh, somebody mentioned IPCC, and, you know, a, a big piece of, of these, uh, you know, supposed net zero policies and et cetera, is efficiency. And, and so I've looked very carefully, painfully, uh, into uh, the, 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 what, what's called the decoupling of economic growth and energy consumption. And if you don't know about this, I kind of encourage you not to bother, but some of you will. So, you know, look at decoupling and you will see that built into the net zero plan, if you like that or don't, um, you know, we're going to somehow figure out 
how to go, how to, how to use, how to increase efficiency by 4% a year beyond what it is. To, well, there's, you know, there's no historical precedent for that. We've never done that. So what is the right number? I've, I've worked it out. It's about 1.2%. So we, we, we do things better over time. We always do. I, I hope so. I mean, I think I do. I, I have a different system for you know, putting away the dishes every time. And my wife still tells me, why do you always put it here? Well, I learned slowly, but, but, I, but I do it better. And so we, we do get better. And, but, the, the, but the better is a pretty small number. And if anybody wants to take a look at those and you know, and challenge me, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to show, but, but that is the, and, and it's, and it's getting worse. Okay. It's just like, you know, the, the economy of China can't grow at 10% a year forever. I mean, we have these S curves and, you know, in, in all physical systems and, and we've achieved a lot of efficiency over, over time. And we're getting to the point of, of going sort of tangential. So we ought to be happy just like, we ought to be happy if we can grow the economy 1.2% a year instead of, you know, angry about it. But so reductionist answer is if we can, it's going to be a miracle that we haven't solved. And I don't think it's going to, it's likely to happen within the window of urgency for either climate change or for the ecosystem, which doesn't mean we should stop working on it. We absolutely should. It's important. I just, I, I see it as you, you know, as you eloquently said in the beginning, I mean, you know, there are first order and second order and third order things. And uh, back when I used to be a manager in a big oil company, uh, the, you know, the management training classes were always, well, you need to categorize your tasks. You know, you take the really important things and we call those A tasks, you know, and you put those in one stack and the less important is B and C and et cetera. And, and what they told us was what most of you guys are going to do, you're going to work on the C's because they're easier to solve. But by the time you're done doing them all, you haven't changed anything because you're still, you, you, you're, you're avoiding doing the hard work. Okay. So efficiency, it's a C. Somebody ought to, it has to be done, but it isn't going to change the state of the system. Anything else? Yeah, we got one more question, but I add to your efficiency. Yeah, so you can potentially put this on your systems chart. So yeah, changing efficiency is a C. Uh, making sure you don't invest the proceeds of efficiency into more growth is Good a point, problem. Good point, Gary. Right? Jevons paradox, there right? Go. There we go. There we go. All right. Well, in the, uh, the talk on this question. Thank you. Um, great talk, and you. you know this is a very good food for thought. So in relation to to fossil fuel as energy consumption, at least from what I've seen, like recently. You know, there is a big chunk of uh, electrification movement, whether in the power industry or in the transportation industry, that actually take a big chunks of, you know, fossil fuel consumption. I've, I've seen the the charts that you've seen uh, that that you've showed just now. I was wondering how you see, like how do you see this? You know, how's prediction moving forward about uh, changes in in trends like this? And you know, we predict a lot of things in the past and. You know, we might not be the best predictor in that. So I, I was wondering on that. That's that's a first part. Second part is I'm, I I I, I look at the answers is to use less energy of this whole discourse. Um, you know, I'm uh, one of your followers on social media, and I've seen a lot of uh, talk about degrowth in this. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, is that the same thing, or you know, who who's going to give up the the quality of life that we have right now? Is it global north, global south? Hey, God. So for Come next week, because Julia Steinberger is has a big degrowth project based in Europe, so you can ask that question again. Go ahead, Art. Yeah, so I mean, I I, I love the degrowth people um, because we're we're kind of uh, spirits in a way, but I think it's as unlikely that that the that the super organism is going to voluntarily degrow as it is unlikely that it's going to, uh, you know, chop off its arm or stop eating. I mean, it, it's just, it, it's not what the superorganism does. Uh, we, we recognize the same thing. Um, you know, that's why I say we're kind of, uh, you know, soul brothers and sisters. I just think it's, I just think it's naive. I, you know, it, it ignores human behavior. The first part of your question, I'm not totally sure I understand it, but 
let me let me make a stab and stop me if I'm wrong. Uh, the idea that big chunks of fossil fuel uh, use are going away is that kind of what you were? Yeah. Well, you know, most of the uh, most of that is on the electric power generation side of things. Okay, and 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 if you look at uh, so we, we have renewables, coal and natural gas are the, you know, the main components of, and nuclear, of course, um, of electric power generation. And, and it's true that, I mean, coal has been going down and nuclear is not going very much of anywhere, but renewables are going way up. And, and if you look at forecasts, projections, and I do it all the time, um, to my detriment, probably, you know, actually, we're, we're we we are actually replacing a lot of coal with renewables. We're not making any progress on natural gas or anything else. And eventually, given enough time, we may let's just say for fun, we get to a hundred percent renewable energy for electric power generation. Let's just say we can do. Let's say we could do it tomorrow. That'd be cool. Electric power generation is less than 20% of our energy consumption. It's a C. We're working real hard on the C. What about the other 83%, which is transportation and steel and plastic and fertilizer and cement and all the kind of stuff that we absolutely, our civilization falls apart without it. The, the, those are the A's and the B's, and we're not working on it because they're really tough. And so the answer is, go for it. Let's do it. And when we're 100% successful, we're still screwed because we're working on the seas, which is what human beings do. I mean, I'm not criticizing it. I'm not saying we're dumb, but we're working. We're, it's the low-hanging fruit. That's what we're doing. Last question, right, Kerry? Uh, yeah, well, thanks, Art. Uh, I was a student here at UT Austin and still work here, and I got a lot of A's, and I'm still trying to work on an A problem right now. So uh, hopefully the others. And you're going to hit me up to help you on it after we're done, right? Uh, actually, I am. Yeah. I so uh, let's thank Art for a great talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.